Hey everybody, I've got something to share with you here on Saturday so you can actually go and take a look at this. I've got an image uploaded for you. As you can see, this is an old uh, Egyptian relief. Uh, it looks like it's been partly destroyed. And uh, I noticed that when I mean, I'm getting to the point where I recognize some of the symbolism so quickly uh, that I, I'm understanding you know, exactly what I'm seeing and I'm able to put the geometry together. Uh, this geometry uh, spans across uh, all these different cultures and that's what a lot of people don't understand is that the teachings are the same but what's happened over time is some of them have been twisted like if you take modern Christianity today it's been twisted from the original teachings even though uh, the historical Jesus spoke himself and said uh, that he teaches everything in parables regardless of that people still take everything seriously but uh, uh, one good thing about symbolism is is it really does help you understand things uh, because of the contemplation that's behind it. Um, and it also helps prove things as well. Uh, like I've shown you so far, it, over time you get to see that these people have been hiding things in this art. Well, here's one thing right here, and we're going to take a look at some of the symbolism behind it. A couple things I want to point out to you are, you know, we have two sides here, right? So if we're taking up the Kabbalah Tree of Life, which this is another version of the Tree of Life, uh, we always have the two pillars. We have the one on the right, we have the one on the left, and then we have that middle one, which is where the man called Zer Anpin, uh, another name for that would be like uh, Jesus, okay, for example, uh, or you yourself, um, somebody who rises in consciousness up that middle, middle pillar. And uh, one of the things that I noticed is that we have right here, oops, it's a little bit too much. Okay, so we have, uh, we have a star at the very top and a circle around it, and we have a scarab beetle. And then we have another circle below that, and then we have the left eye of Horus, or the right eye of Horus, and the left eye of Horus. And uh, what you find about the symbolism is once you apply the geometry, it, everything starts to become crystal clear about what you're seeing. It also is uh, easier to, um, to show equivalence between a symbolism that you see in one culture and what you see in another one when you know that the breakdown is, is what you're looking at is the same tree of life type of thing. If you remember Horus, uh, one of his eyes, I believe his left eye was said to be uh, the moon and his right eye was said to be the sun. Well interestingly enough Christianity uh, has something in it as well and I've shown you that the cross that Jesus is on uh, that you see in all this art is you is actually depicting um, the Kabbalah tree of life when you take a look at the geometry. Horus is the archetype that is equivalent to what we see as Jesus and also equivalent to the archetype what we call Zer Anpin and also you as well. These are uh, the represent archetypes that rise up in consciousness. Okay so the the left eye is the moon and the right eye is the sun. Well, what can we find in Christianity that is similar to that? Okay, so, um, so right here I'm on Google Images. And what I typed in was crucifixion, sun, and moon. And if you look at all these images right here, you'll see that you have Zer and Pen, which is on the middle pillar of the Tree of Life, and then you have the sun on one side and the moon on the other. Now there are some times where you see it reversed and I believe it has something to do with uh, some cultures thinking that the masculine versus the feminine are, are were opposite. Uh, it's my opinion based on everything that I've seen that uh, Kabbalah, the, the classical Kabbalah is the correct one and that is with the sun on the right side, which means that if we're looking at it right here, the sun would be on the right side, and the moon would be on the left. And that is because when we see the tree of life, the process for creation starts at Kether, then it goes to Wisdom, and then it goes to Bina, and it zigzags down the tree. The third Sephiroth is understanding, 
and understanding cannot be had unless there is something to understand, which is wisdom. So wisdom has to come before understanding. We'll go into that a little bit later. That's the reason why. Um, that's the reason why I believe that there. When you see it like this, where the sun is on the left, I think that's a mistake. Um, but there may be another reason that they're doing it. I'm not fully aware of yet. But anyway, that's an example. So of the left eye and the right eye being the sun and the moon. We see it also on the cross. Has anybody ever wondered when they saw this why it was like that? Well, now you know, because we're, we're talking about the Kabbalah tree of life. And in a lot of these images, you see that same angle that Jesus holds his arms in, either at that certain angle, that, six, that 30 degree angle that we see on the tree of life, or sometimes flat, like we see in the Vitruvian man where he does both. Well, let's get back to what we were looking at. Okay, so we've got to figure out a way to line up this geometry. It's a pretty good idea that what we're looking at up here is has something to do with the Trinity. It has something to do with Kether, Hokma, which is wisdom, Bino, which is understanding. Um, and then it looks like we've got Zer and Pen going on here because uh, it's not just the one big figure, but it's also the little figure inside it. It's, it's rising. Um, and so... Uh, that's what we're going to dive into here real quick. So let me pop over to another screen and I'll show you how we build some of this. Okay, I'm starting with it here. And if you notice, it's a slightly different color. And the reason why that is is because uh, when I do this geometry and I'm trying to show things, I have to overlay lots of different things. And if some of them are the same color, uh, it starts getting to where it's muddy. You can't really see it that well. So what I did was I took the other image and I put it here. So. What I've found so far, and I think you'll find this interesting as well, is that, um, and you might want to go out and play with the geometry um, yourself. On when you recognize a hieroglyph or a uh, some kind of symbolism that represents the tree of life, the master key to kind of help you get started to get your foundation going seems to be Metatron's cube, which consists of the fruit of life, which is a bunch of circles. And then from those circles, you draw a point, you draw to the midpoint of each of the other circles. So um, I will show you what it looks like here in just a second. And the giveaway on this was this large circle here and this large circle here. And to me, the two eyes, of course, were the giveaway as well. And plus, the, the two. there's lots of things on here, but just at the first glance, okay, this big circle up here and this little circle down here. And one of the reasons why I encourage you to go out there and do this yourself rather than just hearing it from somebody else if you're interested is because something can be said for playing around with the geometry yourself. There are small differences between one thing and the next that you find. Uh, these small differences lead to a higher understanding of the symbolism and then you, when your mind starts working and unfolding all of the stuff, you begin to see all of these relationships that you wouldn't see if you just get it from somebody. So that's why I highly suggest that don't just say, oh, that's cool. But if you're interested, go out and mess with it yourself. It's really, really important. And one other step I do, of course, is I share it with you. And of course, anybody knows that in order to be able to share something with somebody, you have to know what you're talking about. So, and, and of course, in turn, by doing that, it helps me better understand it. So, um, well, I highly suggest you play around with it yourself, though. But let's take a look at the geometry. So, I've got uh, Metatron's cube right here. And what I've got is since I'm looking at the Tree of Life, let's see, let's take a look at this one here. And if you see, this is Metatron's cube, and you see all these circles there um, drawn. You can look it up on Wikipedia. It has a good example of it and everything. But I want you to notice something really interesting on this, okay? The circle is around, now this is slightly off, probably because of the angle of the picture that was taken of this or whatever, but, but you can see that it corresponds. You have the circle up here that circles a star. This next circle circles the entire beetle. You have a circle around one eye, a circle around the other eye, and then of course the geometry fits perfectly here. You have another circle here. As you can see, we've got something going on here where we got a pretty good idea that they're doing the tree of life thing again here. Now, like I said, it's important that you go out and search for stuff yourself and mess with it yourself because otherwise I wouldn't have known 
uh, to put this piece of the puzzle together. So we have the left and right eye of Horus, and then I remembered an image that I saw uh, where it's an old hieroglyph, and uh, we see Horus, or some guy right here, which I believe is the Zaran pen, the smaller guy. We see the left eye and the right eye of Horus, and then we see uh, a circumpunct on top of his head, and that represents, usually, it represents Kether, uh, and in some cases that we'll see later on when we dig heavier into the Kabbalah, it deals with Doth, which is kind of like a uh, it's taking the knowledge and actually making use of it, uh, whereas Kether is kind of subconscious. Doth is more of the conscious version of that knowledge. And so as you can see here, we have the two eyes and then we have the circumpunk. So what's really interesting about this is if we come back over here and look at this image, we have the two eyes and then we have a scarab beetle, which leads us to believe that the scarab beetle and the circumpunk have equivalent meaning. And we'll find that they do here in just a little bit. Okay, now like I said, the scarab beetle seems to have an equivalent meaning with Kether or Doth. Now remember, when we read in the Zohar, and I will show you the reference to this, that the heart, which is down here in Tepreth, okay, the point of that, or the objective of that, is for that to rise up the Tree of Life, so you don't think of it as static. It rises up to the tree of life until it reaches this point right here, where that right in the middle of that scarab beetle. Okay, so that is right in between what we have as wisdom over here and bina, which is understanding over here. Now, since this is the trinity up at the very top, and the rest of this down here is um, kind of an extension of it, this is where people get confused. Okay. Because the heart, once it reaches this level up here, it actually becomes Bina, which is the left side of the brain. And that's the reason when we look in Kabbalah, Kabbalah is, uh, tells us that there are two organs that are associated with Bina, the left brain and the heart. Because when it reaches this area up here, it is a heart that understands knowledge. It takes the wisdom that's supplied to Bina from Hokma, and it makes knowledge out of it. So it's actually taking what Kether initially provided, Hokma and Bina, and it makes sense of it. And that's why it's like Kether, but it's not like Kether. It's the, kind of the same thing. It's, it's either Kether or it's not Kether. Um, if, it's, if there's no Zaran pen, Kether represents that nebulous full potentiality of, of knowledge. But when it's Doth, when he's risen up to, to between these two, when he connects the two together, then he's also reaching another crown. We'll see that here in just a minute. So this scarab beetle, and why this is so important, <clears throat> is that this is going to help us connect some of the other cultures that we've seen as well. There's a lot of misunderstanding about some of these cultures, and a lot of people have been scared to death, and when people start screaming about something being evil or whatever, you can pretty much assume that you know where that's coming from. I'm not going to name any names, but they're usually the first people to come out and say this is evil or that's evil or that's satanic or this, you know, that kind of stuff without actually looking into the symbolism. And so a lot of people just follow along with that kind of mentality. All right, so if we're looking at the tree of life here, we're looking at the top part of this. This is the trinity. This is where his head just reached. And now let's take a look at Zer Enpen. So this is where we take a look at Jesus on the cross where he's risen all the way to where he's supposed to. And there he is. Check your geometry. Let's check our geometry real quick. And we can do that by, if we take a look inside the uh, uh, Metatron's cube, you'll always see a hexagon right here. And that hexagon uh, actually makes up a star of David, okay? So this is not like a, a Saturn thing. Um, this is like a, it's like a symbol associated to the heart, which is why when we see the heart chakra, it's shaped like a Star of David. Uh, but it also has uh, other symbolism uh, associated with it as well, uh, even uh, dimensions as far as the body goes. The pyramid, for example, its height is uh, 2 pi times, uh, well, if you put two circles together and stack them on top of each other, uh, that's equal to the uh, perimeter of the pyramid. And it just so happens that if you 
put two circles together, one, half here and half here, you get the same thing because the pyramid is associated to man, but I'm digressing. So look at his arm angles, uh, look at his head, see the way his head is, and where is his head located? His head is touching the scarab beetle. It's reached that certain point, okay? And this is going to become important to us as we go a little bit further. I'm going to point some references to you. Okay, so I think you're about ready to see everything kind of put together. So here's our initial image. If we scroll down, here's our geometry on top of that image. As you can see, it's extremely sound. And if we go down further, we can see Jesus having reached the top. You might also take a look at these lines down here that are coming, because it looks like the bottom of a robe or something like that that somebody's wearing. And in fact, if you take Jesus out of the picture completely, it looks like you have a man right here wearing a robe, which is really interesting. And this area right here, which is normally considered doth, or our knowledge that's in the abyss, is where his heart is. Okay. So here is Zarin Pen with the whole tree of life now together. And as you can see, I've used these uh, Metatron's cubes because they are complete, complete harmony with the tree of life and the geometry inside them uh, gives us a lot of information about what we're looking at. So, so there it all is together with the geometry of Jesus. Now we're going to take a look at the scarab beetle information. Okay, so here is the hieroglyph showing uh, the left eye, and really that means the left brain, because this eye is actually, if you take, if you take uh, the right side, if someone's looking to the profile, it's just like he is right there, and you take the right half of their brain off, you're going to actually look into the internal parts of the brain, kind of like what Michelangelo showed us. A lot of people get it reversed, they think it's the other way around, but what, he, what he's actually showing us are all the internal parts of the brain with God's robe and everything else. And this left eye fits on the left brain, and this is also associated with the heart, right? And Bina. And here's your right brain, and then the correspondence that we have here, picture's not the best in the world, the eye of Horus is here, and there's one here. We have that same correspondence. And because we have this right here as Doth, and this right here as Doth, and we have this correspondence being the same, and then we have Jesus' head reaching the beetle, and this is going to become important. I'm going to read something to you from R.A. Schwaller de Lubitz, and then I'm going to show you some uh, similar symbolism from other cultures. And you'll, I think you'll start to see the connection here that this is the same teaching. It's taught all over these cultures, but in, in just various forms. And uh, and so people have thought and that all these things are different, but they're not. It's all based on one teaching, just done in parable and done with slightly different symbolism, but relatively the same. So we can see how this is the same. Now we're talking about the scarab beetle. This is from R.A. Schwaller de Lubix, uh, who studied the uh, um, a temple in Egypt. I can't come to, I can't think of it right off the bat. I should just draw on a blank for some reason. Um, but anyways, he studied this for 15 years, extremely intelligent guy, and he understood the symbolism. Right here he says, Isn't, uh, it is interesting to find this organ contained in an external bony framework, like the carapace of an insect, this characteristic like the sutures of the skull, and the create the entire shape that's formed by the crown of the skull. So right here we have a association between the crown of the skull and the beetle, which is in line with what we're seeing as far as the geometry goes. So it says, uh, and the entire shape thus formed by the crown of the skull could be compared with the image of the scarab, a theme treated in Egypt, especially under Thutmose III and Amenophis III, the builders of the Temple of Luxor. T Luxor, that's what I was looking for. The head of man serves as the symbolic base of this temple. So it seems that when we saw Je uh, Jesus right here with his head in the beetle, that is another confirmation that we're looking at the right thing. You can see how the symbolism is all associated to each other. This is Ari Schwaller de Lubitz. Now I'm going to show you some interesting things about the scarab beetle. Remember he mentioned the sutures, right? So this would be a skull if you're looking at the skull from top down. 
And the sutures, this would be the front of the skull here, and this would be the rear. And you can see how they're similar that we have right here. This also gives us another clue, too, because based on that information, it almost appears as though when we're thinking about the Tree of Life, we're thinking about somebody standing in it and looking with their back to you, right? Looking through it with their back to you. This is kind of what this gives us this information right here as well. Now let's take a look at some other cultures. So here's a scarab beetle. Now look, here's a version of the Egyptian scarab beetle with wings. And this is associated with the head and the skull, right? And the skull is called uh, Golgotha. So if you read the Bible and it says, and they took Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. So you can see how this is written in parable, right? Okay, and so here's the Egyptian one. Now look at this. Here's the Assyrian one. And that sits where? It sits above that tree of life that you see because it represents the area of the skull. You can see the very same similar symbolism all across these cultures. And then the last one here that I'll show you, which is Hermes. And if you are aware, Hermes always has a winged helmet, which means that his head is winged, like these heads are winged. This represents the skull, so this would be a winged skull. And that's exactly what we see when we look at Hermes. So in these various cultures, we're seeing the same symbolism, just slightly different, but it's all the same teaching. So if I zoom out here, here's what it looks like. And uh, I've got the image posted for you on Google+. Plus. Um, if it looks small right here, I've got a really high resolution one, so you can just use your mouse wheel and zoom in on it. So. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, expect some other video. I'm going to start digging into the Trinity. I may not be able to cover it all in one video. I'm trying to make these not too long so people's eyes don't glaze over. There's a lot of information in this, um, but as you can see, the symbolism that we see tells a whole different story than what we've heard. But where it all seems to make sense and come to a point of truth is because that same symbolism is found all across these various cultures. The words may be different, but the symbolism remains the same. And that tells us something very special about what's going on. So, All right, well, you guys have a great day, and I'll talk to you soon.